everything's gone quiet. Well, today's session is going to be more of a theoretical session, but it, it's something that's come back to haunt us, and it's about teaching in specific. So it's now nine o'clock, and I'm going to start sharing my screen. And because I'm in a motel room in Tari working off my phone, if uh, those of you that are co-hosts, if somebody comes in, you'll get a little notification that they're in the waiting room. If you could just admit people when they come in, that would be fantastic. I've, I've, I've been doing that, Mel. Thank you. Okay. I just let Francis in. Oh, you too? Yeah. <laughs> We're ganging up on her. <laughs> okay, so there are, are you guys able to see that screen okay? Yes. Yes. That's the PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Good. Okay. So you bear with me. If you do need, if you do have a question or something, please ask it out loud. Don't just raise your hand or hit the chat button. Uh, for those of you that are acting as co-hosts, if somebody does raise their hand in the chat button, that's come in a little bit later, please, uh, let me know because I cannot see anybody at the moment. And if I do go off screen or out of mode, please let me know because I am on a phone. Okay, so there are a number of theories out there on how to be a better teacher and a better caller. And one of the most mis misconceptions that is very, very common today is a well-known phrase amongst callers, if you really want to learn how to call, teach a class. Another is, if you want to understand how people learn, you can teach. Uh, both, in my opinion, are a wrong way to start. Both statements are absolutely correct. Teaching new callers will help you to learn how to call. You'll develop your skills, but you've got to know your limitations. Teaching new dancers will help you learn how the movements work and everything else, but you have to know your limitations and your dancers have to be aware that Hey, as, as Bill said in earlier discussions, we're both new. We're going to learn this together. And as long as you're open and honest with your dancers, that's fine. But you have to know your limitations. Do not go down that road or the mistake of teaching a class to learn how to call. It is a wrong approach. Okay? You will improve your calling skills, but it doesn't mean you're going to improve your dancing skills or your dancer's dancing skills or your teaching skills. Now, we've had a number of sessions on the way people learn and the different learning methodologies, such as visual learning, audio, kinesthetic, that's bodies in motion and doing it, as well as things like the differences in positive and negative transfer. Positive transfer being learning from something you already know. Negative transfer being taking something bad and bringing it in. For instance, learning right and left through before square through has a negative transfer of the boys wanting to courtesy turn the girls, you know, those kinds of things. There's a myriad of other really important protocols and methodologies in learning. And all of these are true to learning, but they really have nothing in them to assist with actually teaching. Something is still missing out of this equation and it's stuff that we constantly overlook. One of the things that's left out of this equation and particularly in square dancing is the process of teaching as opposed to the process of learning. It is simply not enough to say, learn to present the material you're giving in different ways. And I'm pretty sure most of you have heard that. It is also not good enough to say, figure out how they learn and present the material in the best way suited to that person's learning style. That may work for one person, but you've got a class. It's not enough to say, just give them the definitions, definitions show them how to use it from everywhere, and then use it. And I could go on and on and on, but what these are is, in my opinion, a regurgitation of platitudes about teaching in general, all of which are accurate, but none of which cover the basic fundamental of teaching somebody to learn. So in order to do that, what we have to do is determine what is teaching as opposed to learning. And we've had lots of stuff on learning. That's the ability to take information in and put it out in a meaningful form. But what is teaching? Well, one definition and one that I like is that teaching is the act or profession of giving instructions to learners. That's where most people stop. It doesn't stop there. It involves engaging students 
in understanding and applying knowledge, concepts, and processes. That's teaching. It has to do all of that. Teaching requires knowledge of the subject matter and knowledge of how students learn. Teaching can be done in different settings, such as classrooms, schools, universities, indoors, outdoors, collectively, individually, all sorts of different ways. And it can also use different materials and methods, such as design, content selection, delivery. It doesn't matter what you use, but every one of them will have four important factors. And the first is participation engagement. That means there has to be a two-way engagement between the teacher and the learner. Number two, there has to be instruction on the topic or material, not just giving it to them or regurgitating it, but instruction. That means making sure that they understand it and it's interpreted in such a way that it can be digested and regurgitated and applied. There has to be reflection, and that reflection is by both learner and teacher before, during, and after. Janet made a comment earlier about she records everything she does with square dancing so she can go back and watch it and learn you know, am I doing this right? What can I improve? Oh, there was dancers had trouble with that. I thought I did that right. Oh, it might be just something I can tweak there. That's reflection. And it's done by both the teacher and the learner. And finally, there has to be assessment. And that's assessment of the understanding and application of the material. Okay. And if you can't assess it and use it, then teaching is useless. It, it's learning for the sake of learning with no application. So what we have to do is, how do we achieve effective teaching? Well, there's a number of different ways to teach your students. However, regardless of the activity, if you really want them to connect with the lesson and not just memorize things like facts, definitions, statistics, like is done in most schools, educational systems, it's learn the facts, learn the definition, learn that, regurgitate that. You may not understand it, but you can regurgitate it. Well, if that's what you want, then the best methodology is interactive activities. Now, I'm quite sure some of you out there might know an activity that is an interactive activity that incorporates teaching and learning. And that, of course, would be square dancing. Thankfully, square dancing, what is going on here? Did somebody just? Okay, anyway. Square dancing, sorry about that. Square dancing is designed specifically for this type of learning, okay? And fundamentally, square dancing is actually one of the easiest things to teach and to learn, but that only applies if it's done correctly. And to do that, you have to understand what interactive means. Interactive is not a one-way communication, which unfortunately for a lot of callers, this is all they provide. I'm going to show you how to do this. I'm going to tell you how to do this. I'm going to give you the definitions. We're going to do it. It's one way. Okay. That common method foregoes one-way communication. Okay. You've got to get it two ways or individual learning in favor of collective involvement. It means I'm going to teach one person and it's usually the group or the small collective group of people that get it quickly. You end up teaching to them and you lose everybody else. You need that collective involvement to promote mutual success and engagement with the lessons and the material, and more importantly, with each other. Interactive teaching allows the student to understand not only what they're learning on a deeper and integrated level, but the collective success makes it more, um, it makes it a much more rewarding experience that promotes mutual support and encouragement. So in order to achieve this, these are three words that I want you to incorporate into your teaching activity. The first one is intentional. Okay? As a caller, you do not teach a movement because it's on the program list. If you're doing that, stop because you're doing it wrong. You are teaching because it's something that is necessary for them to know. And you're intentionally introducing it into their repertoire and yours because it's planned and actively determine that now is the right time to put this into their repertoire. The intent of what you teach should be both clear to you and the dancers, not just you. And if you're one of those callers that is out there that says, okay, I just got this new record, but it's got this movement on it, so I'm gonna teach this movement now, and you can only use it with that singing call until four months later when you actually teach that movement, then don't teach that movement. You're not ready to do it. The second word is meaningful. 
the caller must ensure that student development and advancement happens. Okay? That does not mean you got to teach them more stuff. What it means is you've got to develop and advance the understanding and application for their capability of what is and what has been presented. In dancing, like most activities, teaching should build on the previous activities and try and avoid being repetitive. What you teach should enable the students to engage with and develop their skills, develop their understanding and their knowledge in different ways. And these meaningful activities engage the students in active, constructive, intentional, authentic, and cooperative ways. Now, if you get a square that is constructive, intentionally doing what they're supposed to do, they're authentic and they're cooperating, doesn't that sound like good dancing? It does to me. The third word is useful. Learning is where students can take away what has been learned from engaging in that activity and use it in another context or for another purpose. For example, a student can directly apply these skills or knowledge that they acquired to an assessment task or to the next activity, and they can actively and competently apply it to multiple scenarios. Okay. Now that's about teaching in general. Let's look at this IMU concept with a square dance movement. And I've chosen the movement square, to, or square through for an example because it's absolutely perfect, okay? Can it be taught with two couples? Yes. Four boys, four girls? Yes. Half sashayed? Yes. One couple half sashayed? Yes. In a square, in a square between facing couples? In a box between facing couples? Two sets of facing lines? Two sets of working facing couples simultaneous from lines of four or parallel boxes? And so on and so on and so forth. The intentional teaching of two facing couples and the method of the activity has meaning. It can be built on and it builds on what was known. It applies the techniques to recognize that regardless of where you are, two facing couples can square through. And they have a number of different options and interactions to deliberately and with meaning and in a specific location with any number of things to follow. It is useful as the students can now apply this movement to any number of diverse arrangements without hesitation and use it in a myriad of different contexts comfortably and successfully without fundamentally changing it. Okay. Now, going through that, I took square through, and what I took was technical teaching, medical teaching, and mechanical teaching. All of them have those principles, and every single one of those principles applies to the movement square through in that context. It is a perfect movement to really enforce IMU into your teaching. So take the time to learn that. Okay. Within the successful teaching of any con or any topic is the context, content, focus, and interaction. Okay. It's not enough to have a focus on the words or the definitions. It's got to be interactive. Whether the learning outcomes for a movement or a session on a series of movements includes some kind of declarative or functioning knowledge. Sorry? Declarative or functioning knowledge, i.e. the definition focus, almost all of them will be supported in some way by the presentation of information um, to the students. And that includes an interaction. So I'm getting feedback. Is somebody asking a question? I think it was background of bills. I'm muted. Okay, no worries. Okay. So student, students participate interactively or by engaging, watching a demonstration to receive this instruction or any number of different ways, but that interaction has to be two ways. But if we look at it, activities that involve student interaction with content include at least one or a combination of listening, watching, engaging with a written or visual text, possibly engaging with multimedia, all of those things, and it's paired with interactive application. That is a basic fundamental of successful teaching for any activity. But in square dancing, if you listen to, you watch, you engage with a written or visual text, you may employ multimedia, and you couple that with interactive application, my God, that's what we do for a living. And yet we don't fundamentally understand this. Typically, students are more likely to retain that information presented in these ways if they're asked to interact with the material in some way 
apply it with a meaningful and reinforcing context and understanding why it's useful. Now, the axiom for any kind of teaching that you have out there, especially technical teaching or application teaching, mechanical, medical, et cetera, says have it included in another activity type after every five minute minimum or 15 minute maximum chunk of new information. So if you were a doctor and you're learning how to do suturing or something like that, there's the fundamentals. Five minutes later, you're applying that 15 minutes. You take a break away from it and you go away. Now, what activity do we have that says five minute minimum or 15 minute maximum chunk of information, then take a break from it and come back and do it again. Square dancing is perfectly designed for teaching. And yet we don't consider this. We get dancers on the floor for 45 minutes to teach a movement and they're just gone. Now that's the technical science between, behind any activity with effective teaching and learning engagement beyond just knowing the learning types. But consider this, does that sound like teach it, apply it, confirm it, use it? Is our activity not designed that we could use that success format in five minute minimum to 15 minute maximum chunks, something like teach, workshop, patter, confirm it, singing call, use it in context and reuse, keep that movement in the program repertoire, use it with other stuff. Oh, if only there was an activity that could use that format effectively. I wonder what that could be. This is something that oftentimes is not happening and it's not encouraged. And that's getting questions from the students. That should be encouraged as it's a sign of active engagement. You've got to make sure your students are comfortable questioning you, challenging you on what you're teaching. If they do, you're being effective because they're engaged. The questions posed will depend on the intended learning outcomes or the ILOs. For example, ILOs that require students to identify who and where they are, for example, in a formation, might have questions that highlight the relevant aspects of that formation or which require a student to identify key ideas in a movement that they're learning. An example of an ILO that required critical reflection, such as start position and end position, would be something like recycle. It has many of those identify criteria. And if you can look at that in that context, when you're teaching something, identify, apply, et cetera, all those key ideas, then you're going to teach it, making sure that they have that information. However, the questions might ask students to complete what's called a SWOT evaluation. That's strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. I'm introducing that. This is in teaching general, but it's very important because we ignore this in square dancing. These SWOT components, when they start coming out in questions like that, that's to present perspectives of a variety of interpretations of what you are trying to get across. If you get one of those that says, okay, I'm strength, I'm weak, oh, is there an opportunity or a threat? These are your evaluations of the questions being asked. And there's two outcomes. It's either a sign, if interaction engagement and a great opportunity for you as a teacher to reflect and better develop your teaching methodology and style. Um, Janet was saying earlier, she records, she looks at it. If there's something that's happening on the floor, questioning look, dancers break down. She goes through that process, strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat to see what she can do to change that and better develop that teaching methodology and style. But the second part that we tend to ignore is it's also a potential sign of saturation, indicating where to press that stop button and just concentrate on maximizing the success of what came before, okay? So encourage questions, but analyze those questions, understand them and try and find the opportunity. And that opportunity might be stop. We're gonna work on what we know now. We're not gonna carry through with 20 more movements to learn tonight. So let's look at teaching versus calling. Teaching is such a critical component of square dancing and of square dance calling, but like showmanship and timing and vocal techniques, it's one of those things that gets lost in that everlasting search for clever choreography that in truth really doesn't matter. And it is absolutely irrelevant if the dancers can't dance it. Being able to write clever, technically perfect choreography that never fails is a sign of someone being able to understand the definitions, 
but really has very little to do with the performance that they give. It has little to do with the dancer capability. It has little to do with the ability to teach or call. And more importantly, it has very, very little to do with their successful ability to entertain the dancers. Okay, Choreography is a very small part of calling. It's the medium which we present. If you have good choreography and it's danceable, great. The only time choreography is important is if it's bad, because that's the only time they're going to really remember it. Okay? So remember, anyone can call. Not everyone can teach. Great callers can do both and do it well. They will successfully engage their dancers in a positive experience that they're going to carry through their dancing life. So remember this action, properly taught is properly danced. One thing that this session or many of these teaching sessions is not going to do is tell you that there is only one way to teach square dancing, because there isn't. There are many methods, many systems, many teaching lists, many ways of explaining every movement to the dancers in ways that they understand them. But if you remember what we said before, regardless of the method or the list or whatever you use, remember those two things that I was talking about intentional, meaningful, and useful, and participant engaged. It has to be participant engagement between the teacher and the learner. It has to be instructed by being both clear and understandable in both meaning and application. There has to be reflection by both the dancer and the teacher before, during, and after the movement is taught, and use the movement um, and when uh, used and the movement is finished, I hear it. I think about it. When you say square through, the dancer's going to go, ah, I hear it. I think about it. I work my way through it. I reflect on it. I do it. What I did was correct. It's a process. It will go through every movement. And then they can say, I now understand that the knowledge and application of the movement is able to be assessed. And I can understand my assessment, my understanding, and the dancers can assess their understanding by the successful application of the movement in different contexts. Remember square through? They can go through a square through head, square through four with the outside two, square through four, bend the line, square through three. Three different contexts, three different setups, but they're all doing the same movement, okay? Without faltering and being ready for the next command successfully, okay? So all of this theory is good. However, being able to apply the theory is no good whatsoever if we cannot deliver a clear and a clean message to the dancers in the rest of the session. So in the rest of the session, this session, if you can't deliver that in your sessions, it's not gonna work. So in the rest of this session, what I wanna talk about is how we're actually delivering that message. Now you're gonna notice that so far I've used the term teachers and not callers. I've compared the two and believe me, this is entirely intentional. There are many, many great callers out there who are also great teachers. There are also great callers out there that are absolutely horrible teachers. And likewise, there's great teachers out there that are absolutely terrible callers. And there's also great teachers who are average callers. And there's many other permeations as well. Anything you can think of, they're out there. What I want to say right now and for the record is good teaching and calling has nothing to do with the program that you can dance. It has nothing to do with what program you can call to. It has nothing to do with how well you know the definitions. It has nothing to do with how good a choreographer or how good a singer you are. Those are the things that the dancers will judge you on. They will judge you on... Um, those things that they're gonna judge you on are the factors of showmanship and entertainment in the delivery of that material. Okay? It's their success with it. That's what they're going to judge you on. That delivery of material is based on one aspect, and that is success. If the dancers do not have success, then none of it matters. And if you can't accept that, we can't move on. If you can accept it, we can move on. Okay? And let's put it this way. If you can't accept that it's about dancer success, not about how good you are as a choreographer or how well you know the definitions or how clever your choreography is. If you can't accept that, then you're in the, for the wrong reason and you're in the wrong business. So 
what is a successful caller slash teacher? Well, to achieve success as a caller, there's got to be a clear and understandable interactive communication between the caller getting that message out and the dancer interpreting that message and applying it into taking an action. If that doesn't happen, it doesn't matter how good your voice is, how clever your choreography is, what kind of music you use, or any other factor, you simply will not succeed and the dancer simply will not have a good time. So what I've done is I've tried to summarize why it's so important to teach properly, and I've narrowed it down to five things in square dancing. One, the definition. You've got to get the current one, have it, and read it. But you, more importantly, you have to determine what are the specifics of that definition in a holistic context. Holistic meaning in a big, broad, everything context. You can't just read the definition and think that's it. Two, you have to understand the definition. Okay? Not just the words, but understand the intent of the definition and its holistic meaning in context. This is going to come, become very important, and you'll see why shortly. You've got to impart that information and intent of the definition, not just the definition. Teaching the definition in a way that's understood by the dancers. Now, this is so much more than just words on a page or watching contaminations or anything else, but really understanding what is meant by those words in terms of action. That's the IMU and the PIRA context, all of those. And it all comes down to applying the definition as it's taught and using it well and often. That's the assessment. I can take what I've taught, I can regurgitate it, I can look at it, I can put it out there and I can assess how well I do it. If you can get those five things down, you've got it cased. And this way you can both use and build on what was taught without having to go back and reteach it and relearn and unteach it and correct it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Properly taught is properly learned. Now, to really put this concept into, into perspective, what I'm going to do is, I'm, is choose one movement, and then we're going to look at each of those five points. Okay, the movement I'm going to choose, I was choosing something else, but this came up in a, in a very serious and heated discussion, is pass the ocean, number 40 from the basic program. So somebody out there, give me, your explanation of past the ocean. I don't care who, anybody. Pass through, face your partner, step to a wave. Okay, Scotty, give me yours. Okay, absolutely perfect, Scotty. Took a lot more words to say it, but you're muted and nobody heard a thing. You don't have to correct it. I want to leave it like that. <laughs> Hannah. Tell me, how, how would you explain past the ocean? You have to unmute, Hannah. I would say the same as the first speaker said, but also apply that you will, you, you will hold the same person in your hand. Okay. So what he said, but you got to keep hold of the same person in your hand. Um, yes. Brian. I, I would I would say something very similar. Pass through, face your partner, but I would say step to a right hand wave. Okay, step to a right hand wave. Okay, Stephen. Slide through, step to a wave. Slide through, step to a wave. Guido. It's a three part call. I don't get. I don't, I don't don't want that. I'm going to be explaining all that. Yeah. Just, it's, a, just, it's a three. It's a three part call. It says pass through. Face the partner and step to a wave. Okay, good. Now, we've, we've all agreed that pass through, face your partner, step to a wave, okay? It's assumed it's a right-hand wave. We're assuming partners, we're assuming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that all this is background knowledge. The reason I chose this movement specifically in past the ocean. Oh, by the way, Stephen, I saw you had your little hand raised. Remember, I'm working on a phone, so I can't see you if you raise your hand. So if you want to interrupt, please interrupt. Okay. Let's have a quick look here. I'm gonna have such a answer. Okay. Past the ocean. This is right from the book. Okay. Restricted at basic and mainstream to facing couples only. That's good. 
pass the ocean. That's the command. The dance action, pass through, face your partner, step to a wave. Yep, everybody pretty much got that. They all did that. Ending formation, right hand ocean wave. Yep, we all got that clarified. Guido's saying it's a three-part definition, but styling says it's smoothed out. The left side dancer walk in a forward arc ending, a uh, forward arc to their right ending in, to their ending position. The right dancer walk forward joining left hands, hands up styling, turn a quarter with each other. That's a styling thing. Comment. The application of the ocean wave rule is not used at the basic and mainstream, at basic and mainstream. It may be applied in other programs. Now, all that looks pretty clear, but is it? It's Mel? quite. Yes, go um, ahead. When I, I wasn't quite awake yet, uh, when I said it's a three part call, it says past the ocean. Uh, the last part is meant to step to an ocean wave. So I have the three words past the ocean, pass yep. through, face the partner, and step to an ocean wave. Yep, absolutely, and this, but this is what we have for a definition. And I chose this movement specifically. But this is what I teach. Hang on, hang on, Guido, because what, what you're saying is gonna come very clear right now. What you teach, what other people say, can be different, even though we're all working off the same definition. It's not a matter of who's right or who's wrong. This came from a discussion. And even though the styling encourages a smoothed out dance action, the definition of past the ocean has three distinctive parts and callers may take advantage of this in their choreography. This is also in the definitions. It says, also says this call should not be fractionalized at basic and mainstream. Now, all of that seems pretty clear and straightforward. So here's some explanations given from some new and some very experienced callers from around the world and how they quickly explain it. At the SSD level, it's taught slide through, step to a wave. The slide through has already been taught. And please don't correct these because I know some of these are wrong. Some people say pass through, turn a quarter in and make a wave. From the definition, pass through, face in, make a wave. Well, that's not quite what the definition says. Others say, well, you pass in and make a wave. Others say pass through, quarter in and make a wave. One said, girls left touch a quarter, boys move forward to the outside and end in a wave. And it has to be a right hand wave because you're doing a left touch a quarter and that's explained that way in the styling. Right hand dancers take left hands as you pass and all move forward turning a quarter into a wave. Pass them, face them, touch them. Okay, pass through, turn a quarter toward the center and step to a wave, right handed. Every single one of those explanations was correct and the dancers were able to dance past the ocean when it was taught to them. And I'm quite sure a few of you can see some fundamental problems. All I can say is, wow, this is a simple movement. And with that, I've recommended rereading the definition and rereading the whole definition. And that definition includes the first several pages of very important information to understand the meaning in a holistic context. And the reason I'm using this, and I'm spending a little time, it starts with restricted at basic and mainstream to facing couples only. Okay, so what is a facing couple? Anybody? Any two people standing adjacent. Okay, that's any two people standing adjacent. That is a couple. What's a face, facing couples only? No, looking at another one, another one with the same specifications. Okay, so it's two people standing side by side facing two people standing side by side. That's a, pretty much the way it's defined. There's no gender in that explanation, but the definition says it's restricted to facing couples only. Your partner is defined by the starting position of this formation. So there's no unclear meaning of who partner is through the movement. These are all explained in the definitions in the first several pages that you're expected to have read even before you get to circle left. Okay, and the command example says pass the ocean. That takes two beats to say. Great, not a problem. Let's go look at the dance action. There are three parts to this as explained. Yep, pass through, yep. 
from facing couples, pass-through is pretty clear. There's no gender specific specifics indicated. Pass-through has no problems. Pass-through has been taught as passing right shoulders with the person in front of you or the person that's facing you and ending back to back with that person that you've already passed. I think we can do that. And in most programs at this point, when we're doing past the ocean, we've already taught pass-through. So there shouldn't be any problem with that. The next part is face your partner. Yep, again, your partner was defined from this movement from the starting formation of facing couples. And who your partner is in a couple is pretty clear. That's defined in all that first part. So you've got to read it all. If the partner relationship in this movement is not clear by this point, you shouldn't be teaching this, nor should your dancers be ready to dance this movement. Okay, so remember that. In this case, your partner is defined in the starting position with the definitions of partners. And that meaning of that definition is after the pass through, that partner, whether it's boy or girl, is who you turn and face after the first bit. You identify your partner, you pass through, you turn and face that partner. And we have already taught face your partner already because face your partner, do side do, face your corner. We've taught that already. Please note, it does not say face in, it does not say face out, it does not say quarter in or quarter out or anything else. It simply says face your partner who has already been defined. Yep, that's pretty clear in my head. So why do we use other things like turn a quarter in or a quarter out or turn to face the center and all that? Simply put, it's because they have a meaning elsewhere. And if you do not know it yet, don't use it yet. And if you do know that it has a meaning elsewhere, definitely don't use it because it will be much harder to unteach. Now, Stephen said what I was hoping somebody would say, and I'm pretty sure he, he did it intentionally because I know he knows how to do a pass the ocean. He said, slide through, face your partner, make a right hand wave. And I saw the faces and the hands go, no, 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 you can't slide through. What if we're same sexes or what if we're in half sachet or things like that? Thank you, Steve. That is exactly what I wanted. And I know you did that intentionally. You wouldn't use that because that's not correct. But it is correct for that group of people that he was teaching at that time. And they could do it, but for, it limits them. The third part, step to a wave. Okay, so. Hmm, from facing dancers, step to a right-hand ocean wave. That's, where does it say step to a wave is a right-hand ocean? Oh, that's, oh yeah, that's right, ocean wave at the beginning. Unless otherwise specified, it's a right-hand ocean wave. Okay, that's pretty clear. But it's only clear if you've read all of that stuff and you understand that beforehand, not just the definition of past the ocean. It means step forward and slightly left, raising the right hands to meet cross palms in a nice ocean wave formation with the elbows bent, tucked in, Bend hands forward below the shoulders, making a right-hand mini wave to the person in front of you. Or if there's more than just the two of you, you do the same thing, but join all the hands in the ocean wave. So you get that. Yep, that's pretty clear. We've taught ocean waves before. We've taught step to a wave. We've taught touch to a wave. We've even taught do si do to an ocean wave. So making a right-hand ocean wave should be pretty clear. The ending formation. Well, if it wasn't clear, it is now. Right-hand ocean wave. Right. This even clarifies, as, as Brian was saying, a right-hand ocean wave to ensure there's no confusion. Pretty straight, straightforward still, right? Okay, timing takes four beats, yep. The styling says, this three-part definition is smoothed out. The left dancers walk forward in an arc. Oh, wait a minute, is that a pass-through walking forward? You don't pass-through walking in an arc. The right hand dancer walk forward to join left hands. Oh, and turn a quarter with the left. Okay, so a left touch a quarter. That's not the way the dance action is defined, but that's the styling. Hmm. Well, this is where this, and that styling is written in the definition. This is where stuff gets really confusing because the basic premise is let them dance, and dancing with style is part of this. And many callers say that, well, if it's styled that way, why not teach it that way to make it easier for the dancers? This has led to other callers saying, you can roll because from an ocean wave at plus, you can call past the ocean from an ocean wave, which is a center's hinge and the others move forward a quarter. Oh, you mean lock it at A1. But others say you can't roll because the end is a step forward to an ocean wave and a pass through is a no hands movement, but that's not what the dancers do. Pause, take a breath here. 
And then if we do this for the dancers, then we should change the definition. So I'm going to call it the way they dance it. So it wouldn't be a surprise to them when I call it from a few, you know, a few weeks at the plus level. And I can, you know, teach, call past the ocean from an ocean wave. Let the definition that's written be Dan. And I'm going to use that role issue only if it comes up later on. Okay, not my issue at this moment. And I'm pretty sure that each and every one of you in this room has faced that discussion or has looked at that past the ocean, uh, having it explained or another dancer explain, girls left touch a quarter, boys move forward to the end of that wave. If you haven't, you're lucky. Then we get into the comments, and this is still all one definition. The application of the ocean wave rule to this call is not used at basic and mainstream. Okay, it says that very clearly. It may be applied to other programs. Uh-oh, here we go again. Hmm. Pass through, face your partner. But who's your partner in a wave? If it's defined as the starting formation is facing couples, but they're in waves, who's your partner? Caller Lab's still arguing about who's your partner in a wave. It's not a big argument. It's very clear. Your partner is defined by the call. The next call defines who your partner is in a wave. Okay. But you only know that if you've read not only the guidelines, the applications, and all the stuff beforehand. An ocean wave is two facing couples, but the ocean wave rule doesn't apply. Oh, wait a minute. It does apply at plus. So it's got to apply at basic and mainstream. We're just not allowed to use it. Okay. The truth is, yes, you can call past the ocean from ocean waves and at higher. But my question to you is, why would you call that unless you're trying to trick the dancers? And if you're using this, well, yuck, and shame on you. Unless you are just trying to prove how clever you are or just how great your choreography is. You're Mel, you're saying, you're saying that the um, um, definition of your partner is, is defined by the next call. Generally, um, yes. What happens if the next call is part of the trade? And that's, that's where, like I said, the controversy comes. I'm going to be explaining... Yeah. Be, be patient because there's a whole bunch of things. I put that in because that's the explanation that's in the guidelines. Your, car, your partner is defined by the next call. Well, what is a partner trade in an ocean wave? Is it with the one you have right hands? Okay. Then you got to go into the, the first call, the call that got you to that position. You do do side do to um, ocean wave and then say face your partner. Do you face the one that you're holding right hands with or do you face your um, partner according to the facing couple rule? Because... And, and this is a good question, because when, if, I, if I have two facing couples and I say face your partner, if I'm doing past the ocean and I say pass through, face your partner, your partner is defined. The ocean wave rule applies to pass the ocean. So your partner should be the one that's facing the same direction as you in an ocean wave, unless there was another call. And, it, and we could go on. That's an entire session from there. And yeah. the, the reality is, there's no specific answer to that as yet. Okay. Well, yes. there's, there's something I would like to add. Once mm -hmm. you have done the pass-through and you, and, and you do a handhold, who is your partner after the pass-through? Ah, no, 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 Guido. See, you're, you're missing it again. No. There, there's, there's no. There's nothing in the definition that says take the hand of the person beside you after the pass-through. And um, you can't. And you can't do that anyway because the styling says those on the right hand have to take left hands. But with when, other right hand when I teach, when I teach the call, I do a pass through, and then yep, absolutely. whether it's an ocean wave or not, they have a handhold <laughs> after the pass through. Absolutely, Guido. But what I what I'm getting at is I'm not saying how I teach it, how you teach it, how anybody teaches it, because a lot of us have identified these as problems. What I've used is past the ocean just as an example, because it came up in a conversation on Facebook, which got really heated about how to teach this movement and how to explain it. That's why I'm using it. Most of what I'm saying here in that list of how to explain past the ocean is wrong. Most of us here can all accept that that's not the correct way of doing it. And yes, you do teach it correctly. What Brian's question, I think that was Brian that asked is, who's your partner in an ocean wave? That opens up a whole new technical thing for callers trying to explain to dancers and dancers going, what the hell? I just want to dance. So bear with me because there's a few things coming up here that are going to explain why these problems are. I'm not trying to fix the definition of past the ocean or correct or, or how people teach it. I'm just showing that there's inherent problems in how callers can read the definition, interpret it, 
try and explain it to the, the dancers in such a way that is often wrong or incomplete, but it works for them. And then they have to go back and fix things later. A lot of callers do it absolutely correct. I'm not, not arguing with that. So bear, bear with me a, a bit, <laughs> okay? But if, like I said, if you're gonna use past the ocean from ocean waves, don't. That's just my personal opinion. It falls in that category of just because you can doesn't mean you should. Another thing to remember in the definition, even though the styling encourages a smooth out dance action, it also states the definition of past the ocean has three distinctive parts and callers may take advantage of this in their choreography. Okay, now how do you may take advantage? Of course, that's fractionalizing, but it also says don't do that. My big thing is a lot of callers get to that part of the definition, say may take advantage in their choreography, and that's where they stop reading. Don't stop reading there. It goes on to say this call should not be fractionalized at basic and mainstream. And this is important. This is where the word, words should not are there. The words are not, must not, but please remember, just because you can do things or you should do something, that's not a rule. Just because you should doesn't mean you must. And just because you can definitely does not mean you should. It also says it may be applied from ocean waves using the facing couple rule, which by the way, does sort out that partner relationship, but only for that movement. But once again, may is not should, okay? So past the ocean is one of those things that in my opinion, should never be fractionalized unless you're dancing challenge material or mathematically technical stuff that some callers and dancers like. I don't, don't be grudging that. I personally don't like it. I don't judge it. However, if you want to keep dancers interested, engaged, and having fun, teach them properly, dance it properly from the beginning. Let them dance it. Let them dance it for at least 20 years of fun and pleasure before going into that yuck of technical calling, you know, do a two thirds past the ocean with a whoppity splash ding dong from an ocean wave. I don't even know what the heck that would be. Okay, so it's absolutely imperative that callers and teachers read the definition, they understand the definition, and, and this is where we fall apart, they can interpret those words of the definition as well as the holistic intent. And this is where Guido was uh, going. It is three parts. He teaches it, he interprets it, and he puts it into that holistic intent. Even though there's styling quips that, yeah, it can be smoothed out in a context, he puts it in that context, but he looks at it, the holistic intent, and the dancers are aware that it is a three-part call. Pass through. There it is. Your partner's defined after the pass. Face that partner. That person is defined. Step forward to a right-hand ocean wave. That is already defined. Styling may dance it this way, but holistically it is three parts and it's taught that way. It's absolutely crucial that, you know, the dancer and the caller are able to explain, show, demonstrate, communicate, facilitate, and utilize that explanation of the definition, regardless of the words to use, that the caller can get that across to the dancers to apply the command words past the ocean. To an action that is successfully be able to be done using those command words in action repeatedly and repeatedly from different application variations and formations and arrangements as applicable to each movement okay not just past the ocean but with everything within and i put this in brackets within reason the essence is to teach right learn right and if you do that your dancers and you are going to build confidence and progress with comfort, use, and success. And that's that's where I was getting. And we had this discussion just on past the ocean. There's a lot of comments about what is and what isn't. I'm just using what is written. And I did that intentionally because I want you, I'm gonna go through this and I want to explain this. <clears throat> Starting formation, a couple or a man and a woman that are facing. Is that pretty clear to everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. The dance action defined as couples, unless otherwise specified, may be any combination of men and women. That's pretty straightforward. Works as a unit and turns around 
with the left side dancer backing up and the right hand dancer walking forward. The turning point is halfway between the dancer. Okay, so a couple, we're going to turn around as a couple. The turning point is halfway between us. Facing dancers blend into a normal couple defined as normal couple with a man on the left and a woman on the right as they perform this action. That's pretty straightforward, yes? Yeah. The amount of turning is governed by the following rule. The turning amount can be given explicitly or by the final facing directions, for example, to face back in or at the total distance. Example, centers go full around and face the outside too. Or it may be given explicitly. If, and then it says, if the rules are contradictory or none apply, then the amount must be given explicitly. Okay, so you have a defined term that says, okay, all the way around, full around, or a specific direction. If it's not given, a couple that has other dancers behind it turns 180 degrees to face the other dancers. Dancers working on the outside of the set turn to face the center of the set. If an active outside man is facing in with an active woman coming towards him, then the couple turns to face the direction which the inactive man has been facing. The ending formation is couple facing in to their group of four or the center of the set. The woman left hand palm down, the man palm up. Now, if I was to look at this, and I looked at it specifically, okay. A couple, unless otherwise, so we already define couple. It says gender is not specific. Okay, it works as a unit turning, yeah. Facing dancers blend into normal couples divine. So if I have, for instance, a man facing a woman in front of me, or I have two boys facing two girls, okay? I'm going to take my partner, work as a couple, turn around, but I've got this dancer facing in front of me who is of the opposite gender, and I blend in with this facing dancer to end as a normal couple, which means I have to pass that person in front of me and turn around with her to face the direction I was facing and blend into a normal couple because a normal couple is, is defined as a man on the left, a girl on the right. So if I have a boy on the right and a girl on the left, what I have to do is I have to start this and basically start wheeling with the center of the turn where the hands are joined in the center, but at part way we have to blend, so we have to let go of hands and then the man will slide over to his left, the girl will slide over to her right to face the, the couple behind them. So if I had a half sachet couple, they would turn as a couple and blend into a normal couple, man on the left, girl on the right, as they perform that action. Is that correct? Is that the way you guys read that? More or less, yeah. I only have one problem. Uh, this is the, the curse of being from a different language as a mother language. What do you mean as denied? Uh, sorry, I should, I should have said as defined, not denied. Okay. <laughs> I corrected it in the text, but I didn't correct it on the slide. Sorry about that. Now, when you look at something like that, okay, first off, let's start um, very quickly. I'm going to ask, now we've got a definition from Caller Lab. I'm going to start uh, Masako. I'm going to put you on the spot. What movement is this? Um, sorry, I I was trying really hard to follow you, but now I'm honestly lost. <laughs> sorry. I would be too. Um, Yolanda, what movement is this? I sort of tuned out after a while. It's like it's too complicated <laughs> too, too wordy. not too complicated too wordy absolutely too wordy. and and i am doing this intentionally scotty what movement is this francis is in terror because she knows i'm coming to her next what is it scotty oh bloody idea okay francis what do you think 
Um, wheel around. <laughs> nope. I know what it is. Courtesy turn. Courtesy That's turn, mm -hmm. yep. It's courtesy turn. Now, this is the problem, and Guido said it, especially. It says a couple, man or a woman, that are facing. Couple or a man or a woman. This part here of the turning point between the dancers, dancers blend into normal couples. And what happens if I have a half sachet couple? Can I do a courtesy turn? Not really. You, 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 know, you, know, you know, there's all these things, but this is all in the definition because, oh, wait a minute, I'm restricted at basic and mainstream. If I don't take the whole definition in its holistic context and I only look at the words of the definition, I'm sure we can all teach courtesy turn, can't we? <laughs> but if I go through it and try to explain it using the definition to make it simpler for the dancers, what happens? We get Scotty and a few of the others and the going, I tuned out because I just lost you. Oh, it's just got. This is the problem that we have when we're teaching is we rely a lot on the words and then we teach what we're trying to do based on the definitions. And if we're not very clear in making that representation and making it very clear to the dancers so that they can uh, interact, go through that process, say, what is it I'm going to do? Okay. Oh, and right. Okay. What did, what did, what did that, that, that guy from Australia say? Oh, okay. I intentionally taught this movement. Okay. Is it meaningful? With those definitions, it's not meaningful, but I can interact. I can do it intentional. I can make it meaningful. Is it useful? Yes, I can do that. And are the dancers able to apply that? Okay. Is it participation engaged? Yes. Okay. There's there a reaction between the dancer and the learner. Is it instructive? Is it both clear and understandable and both meaning and application? If I put the meaning out and I apply it into a context, yes. Is there reflection by both the dancer and the teacher? The reflection for the teacher would be look at that definition and say, how do I explain that better than what's written? It's technically correct. And I've got to put all the rest of those holistic intents and all the rest of the facing couples and applications and restrictions into context so that I can get this across to my dancer. That's my reflection. And the dancer's got to be able to reflect on when they hear courtesy turn, they know what to do. And am I able to assess that? P-I-R-A, in participant engaged, instructive, reflective, and accessible. Okay. I can assess my understanding by the successful application of the movement in different contexts without it really, really, really badly screwing up the dancers. Now we are we're callers in a context. And even callers in a context looking at the definition without the rest of that cause confusion. It is, of course, the definition of courtesy turn, but you can see now why it's important to read the entirety of the definition, as well as the intent of the definition, as well as the restrictions of the definition, as well as the rules of dancing, as well as the guidelines and the complete package. Otherwise, if we just give that definition, and there's a lot of callers that do it, things get lost in the translation. And when you get lost in the translation, translating it into another language can even make it more confusing. And if you add a typo, I'd love to say it was intentional, but it wasn't. If you add a typo, it changes the entire context. Defined to denied changes the entire context of what's going on. So you, do, do you all understand what I mean about teaching in a context environment? And that I am you and that Pira. If you take nothing else away from these lessons, I am you, intentional, meaningful, and useful, participant engaged, interactive um, my mind is going what's the r anybody quick, quick. the the thing reflective sorry and then accessible if they can engage in it they can get taught in it if they can reflect on how to use it in these contexts and then it can be assessed and applied you're going to have success with your teaching now that's across any teaching spectrum, but this activity of ours is very, very specifically designed to meet all these criteria. The people that started this realized this right at the beginning. 
and this was long before Caller Lab. They wanted an activity that you could teach people to do something and interact collectively together with success. We've lost that in the search for creative or more inventive choreography to try and prove how clever we are. And then we've gone into the political correct and excuse my language, but it has something to do with what comes out of the north end of a southbound cow that these definitions have become over many, many years to get technically perfect that have done nothing but confuse it because the people that are making these decisions say, well, if it advanced, I can use this. Well, then I can use this in basic and we're pulling this down and so on and so on and so forth. Those are big problems. There are callers out there that have been calling for many, many years very successfully using these programs. Brian Hotchkeys in my top right-hand corner is one of them. Brian Hotchkeys is able to call a creative, inventive, fun dance. It may not be technically perfect all the time. Brian, Brian is the first one to tell you that oh, I made a mistake if he makes a mistake. And the dance may not be technically perfect. There may be a pause or a pause and break. But I can guarantee you, if you go to one of Brian's dances, you're going to be laughing and having fun. And you're going to be laughing with, and sometimes you're going to be laughing at, especially when he gets on stage at his age, still wearing a yellow polka dot bikini when he does that song. And no, I'm never going to let that go. But the activity is there. What he, the message he gets across, even when he's teaching a workshop, is clear. The definition is applied in a context that it's clear to the dancers, but it meets the parameters of the definition, and its holistic intent is there so that there's no misunderstanding, and it's used in context. There's not a whole crap load of words that are politically correct to say this is what. Those definitions are for callers. They should be given to the dancers as a reference. It says that in them. But understanding them is for the callers to understand and be able to answer questions, but also have the good common sense and judgment to apply them effectively in a holistic content with the intent. And your intent as a caller should always be to entertain, engage, and have the dancers have success so they want to come back and enjoy you. And that's why Brian can go to New Zealand or Germany or North America and call the same dance he called 20 years ago and still have a full floor and they'll be on there enjoying and having success. He doesn't Thank call you. Dance all the time, but he, he does. Thank you for your comments, Mel. Um, when, when I make a mistake, I usually blame another caller who is is there you know I'll, I'll say oh that's a piece of choreography that hannah gave me and i'm not going to use that again yeah and it's and it's done that way and every single dancer knows so, oh, sorry sorry you listening to me sorry hannah no i'm fine all right uh yeah it, it's dancers will engage with you a lot better if you engage with them. And we had a couple of sessions that say, teaching and calling is a two-way communication. It is not you behind the microphone spewing garbage into a microphone that comes out of a speaker. If that's what you're calling, then you're doing it wrong because you are going to be lifeless. And I take this, this particularly to heart because I did call a dance like that in Germany. When I was young and starting, I went to Hamburg I practiced, I practiced, I had all my material written out, all my modules. I knew my dance was technically correct. It was perfect. I'm pretty sure my timing was good. My delivery was good. And it was the worst dance I ever called because there was no feeling in it. There was no interaction. The dancers danced okay. They got through it, but it wasn't there. It was a one-way piece of communication. There was no interaction. And if you've got that and that's what you're calling for, you're calling for yourself, not the dancers. I wanted to show how good I, that I was ready. That showed that I was not ready. Even though my choreography was good and it was right, I was not ready to call because I was focused on me, not on giving the dancers entertainment and success. And that's what teaching is. Getting them to have success so they can go anywhere. Right, let's open it up for questions or discussion.
Wow. Well, I agree. I agree with some of the definitions. Chase writing plus is you read the definition, really not good to explain, but the one in brackets is fine. Yep. Because they've got an exaggerated zoom, and the first question is, what is an exaggerated zoom? So, yeah. Um, use, com use common sense. Yeah, that's where you get into the holistic interpretation of the intent. These definitions are taking into account that if you're teaching plus, you know how to understand the basic and mainstream program. You know how to teach the mainstream program, and you know what the intent of this is. You know what an exaggerated motion is. You know what an extended motion is. So that's an assumption that's there. But when you look at that definition, the people look at, oh, Chase, right, an exagger what's an exaggerated zoom? That's never defined. It shouldn't have to be defined because if you're teaching plus, you should already have been teaching basic and mainstream. You should already know that and know what an exaggerated zoom is. The reality is many callers start by calling advanced or challenge or plus. They don't start calling basic and mainstream. They don't learn the fundamentals. They do that. And of course, when you read that definition, just like courtesy turn, if you read the definition in isolation, you read Chase Wright in isolation without that background knowledge, it loses the context of its meaning. And you're absolutely right, Roz. That is one that is a very good specific one. Brian, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I was just going to go back um, to early in the discussion, Mel, when you were talking about square through yeah. um, and, uh, and the fact that dancers want to do a courtesy turn after the first hand um, if you've taught right and left through first. So quite a few callers are saying don't teach right and left through before you teach square through, teach the square through first. I don't do that because uh, I find I get too much mileage out of right and left throughs yep. before I, I teach square throughs. And I was talking to Milton Luttrell um, way back in 1985 when I was at his club in um, Texas. And we were talking about this and he said he doesn't have any trouble with the dancers doing the courtesy turn after the first hand because he teaches square through from a half sachet formation. So the dancers can't do the courtesy turn. And uh, we were talking about, well, isn't it more difficult to do it from a half sachet position? And the answer to that is, of course not, because if the dancers know, don't know how to do it either way, um, a square through from a half sachet position is, uh, yep. is no more difficult than it is doing it from an all position. But it does avoid the dancers having to do or, or wanting to do the courtesy turn after the first hand. Absolutely. Now, when I first started doing it, um, I did head couples half sachet and then taught them the square through. But then you end up with the issue that you've now got a boy facing a boy and a girl facing a girl, which is not ideal because how are you going to get out of that situation when you're working with beginners? So I, I came up with the idea of having head men take your corner up to the middle and back. And then I would teach square through with those dancers, the head man in his corner, which then ends you facing your original part with a right hand free. So you can go straight into a right and left grand if you want after the square through, which makes it a really, really nice, smooth movement. After you've got Ab it to- Absolutely, Brian. One and one, um, at the beginning, I said, teaching methodologies or teaching lists vary from caller to caller. It doesn't make one right and one wrong. Your success and the dancer's success is what makes it right. I've also seen callers that teach square through by having all the ladies form couples on one side of the hall, all the men form couples on the other side of the call, and they start, and then they move two boys over two girls after they've taught square through with the boys and square through with the girls. Then they move boys and girls working as couples together, and then they do it half sachet, and then they do square through. One is not right, one is not wrong. The thing is, a lot of people don't teach right and left through because of the square through problem but they will teach right pull by courtesy turn. They will teach pass through courtesy turn, which has a, inherently the same problem. I wasn't talking about square through that being the problem. That was an example of positive and negative transfer, by the way, there is that. And where that happens is when teachers teach and you have that kind of application that is not clear in the definition, it means you've got to go back and revisit how you taught and what you did 
because if there's negative transfer coming into your teaching, the dancers are not going to accept it because it will never work for them. But they will develop the habit of negative transfer, such as the courtesy turn, that if you don't correct it and make sure it doesn't happen or do something to correct it, they will always do that and they will always have fundamental success. So find a way, as Brian says, take your corner up to the middle and square through four. Find your partner right and left grand. Now, chances are, if somebody did do a wrong turn, within those 10 or 12 beats of music, depending on where you start, find your partner right and left grand. They'll make that mistake once. And then he'll do it again with the sides or they come back and do it with the heads. They get that flow. And that is your participant engagement, your reaction, your interaction, your reflection, and your assessment able to be doing it all pulled into one intentional, meaningful, and useful. It meets those criteria. That's why Square Through is such a great movement because it meets all the criteria. Thanks for the example, Brian. Very well said. Roz, you got your hand up. Yeah, just on the quest on Square Through, you've probably partly answered it. We have one dancer, his problem is at the end when he's to face the corner, he turns around. He actually hangs on as he's doing the last one and then it actually turns around all the time. Okay. And doesn't always listen, does he, John? <laughs> so, so how do you go with that, Brian? How do you conquer that? What I, I, I'm, I want to address that. Try putting them into couples, like a Sicilian circle or couples, not into squares. Just do something a little bit novel mm -hmm. so that you get them and you get them, say, two circles, square through four, move to the next. And you just reapply that, move to the next, move to the next because they have to move forward. They can't turn around. To get, get that forward motion going. Yeah. Yeah. You can all, and there's all sorts of different things. Start it, you know, a, a beautiful sequence for, for that. After you've done your square through, okay, if, if it's always facing the corner, get them to the corner without doing the square, do the right and left through, star through, pass through, okay? Square through four, you're facing out. Bend the line up to the middle and back. Square through three, there's your corner. You know, it's a nice little combination of movements that takes you from that head scroll through. Uh, where's my partner? I got to got to look and see if she's doing it right. And it's been my experience that when you have partners dancing together and they're always turning around to look at it, it's because their insecurities, they're trying to dance somebody else's dance rather than their own dance. And you can, there's a secret. You can only dance one person's dance at a time. And that's yours. Mel, uh, Yolanda you, has you, a comment. Yeah, you have your hand up. Actually, I had the same thing, Ross. And oh, okay. so um so he wanted to turn and then he was going the other wrong way, right? Yeah. So um I took every right and left through out of my choreography. And then after a square through four, I did a right hand star and then a left hand star, and I followed it up with the a fig a figure in the singing call that had that as well and it worked because <laughs> he was thinking ahead that he had to make the right hand star and it broke him of it oh okay yeah that's worth janet, a try janet you have your hand up and then john what i do with the square through and several other calls is i have them count it's mm -hmm. square through four they're going to go one two three, four. And I tell them when you hit that number, if it's a square through four and you hit that number four, there's no more turning. If it's a square through three, when they hit that number, that hand, that's that number three hand, you're done turning. There's no more turning. So they know that they're just going straight after that. They're not making that turn. That's why I always have them counted out. A lot of like uh, one of the prompts that I use and I've heard other people use, I actually picked this up off a caller in Germany was on a square through four, one in, two in, three in, four, straight ahead. Mm. And that's how they timed it. And, and, and it would go because, hey, from a static square, 12 beats of music, <laughs> couples, 10 beats of music, bang. And it's just one in, two in, three in, four, straight. And you're right to the next call and it would prompt that way. Now, is that right? Not necessarily. It did help the dancers. You wean them off of it. Is Brian Hotchkey's way of take care, Simon. Thanks for coming in. Mm -hmm. Say hi to Susie. 
It is Brian Hotchkey's way of saying, right, I'm going to start by teaching this half sachet right. Maybe, maybe not. May not work for everybody. It works for Brian and he does it very well. And he, he incorporates that kind of material in a lot of his dances, which is just that it's not different. It's just a little bit of novel variety that you would do instead of saying heads half sachet square through four or everybody half sachet square through four. However, doing it that way, it just feels different. But they're doing the same thing that they would do, right. okay. and it makes okay. that change of feeling different by reinforcing what they already know. There are a hundred ways to do that to introduce little bits of variety. Yes, Brian. Uh, sorry, I, I had John next, and then Brian. Okay. Yeah, Bill. <clears throat> with that same gentleman Ros was talking about, um, when he when he was having trouble with it, I on the floor with everybody dancing, I would say, like um, Janet said, I get them to count. And I said, when you reach the number the caller said, or if he says square through the fourth hand, you must end up, when you pull by with that person, you end up back to back. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to fix it a little bit. But whenever he's dancing and he's got to do the square through, I tell him where he's, I, I basically say where they've got to go to, like from a static square, square through four to your corner. Mm. And that yep. has helped him a that bit. Helps. But he still mm -hmm. has trouble. Um, be, be I think Scotty get, knows who we're talking about. Be, be, <laughs> the, the, the who is irrelevant because it's, it's a very common problem. I want to mm. ask a general question before I get to you, Brian. Um, tell me how you would explain. Now, I don't want the definition, just how you would explain I'm going to do a square through. What's part one? Square through four, what's part one? Uh, well, part one, I say you're, you're going to uh, start with the right hand with the person you're facing, and you're going to pull by and turn in toward your okay, partner. Good. good, good, stop there. Uh, Phil, how would you start? Actually, I started with a, a square through one and make it up to a square through four. Okay, so, so you, do, do you start square, with a square through one, right pull by. Yeah, and then do you turn back and then do square through one again. Then okay. go on to square through two with the U-turn back uh, between the square through twos and go up to square through four. So I have always the uh, half the shade arrangement. Okay, uh, Yolanda? Just, I'm um, going to teach square through four. I want you to give me... The first two hands of square through. Just tell me what you'd tell the dancers. So you it was a done. it was a right hand pull by and face is that, in. Is that the, the first part? Okay, part one, right pull by, face in, yep. And then left hand pull by face in. Okay. Now but I would normally start with a square through three or five. <laughs> okay. Now here's a question for you, and Guido's chomping at the bit because he already knows where I'm going with this. If you have people that turn on a square through, especially on their last hands, have you ever gone back to read the definition of square through? Part one of a square through four is right hand pull by. There's no turn, there's no face in. Part two is face partner, left pull by. Part three is face partner, right pull by. Part four is face partner, left pull by. <coughs> And it says incorporate the amount. Now, there's a reason for that. And one of the reasons why I was looking at that is if you remember what we we're talking about with past the ocean, face partner. Is that part of the movement? Where is your partner? Once you've done a right pull by, you finished square through one. But we start square through. Okay, we're going to go right hand face in, left hand face in. And we make that turn part of the first movement. One. Right pull by, turn in. Two, left pull by, turn in. Three, right pull by, turn in. We prompt it, we teach it like that instead of one, right one, pull by. Three. Two, turn Ooh. in, left pull by. Mel Wilkinson. Yeah. So when, yeah. when, you, when you do these things, I'm just gonna pull this up. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Now this this is what Philip was saying. He starts by teaching square through one, then square through two. So always, when you hear that number, you know that number means go straight ahead. It's square through three. When I get to three, I go straight ahead, and th and that's what's. 
Now that's just a little thing. Brian's method of square through half sachet works a treat because when they're half sachet, dancers are quite uncomfortable at the first. Doesn't make his method wrong, but all it takes is one dancer to think that turn in is part of each movement and they'll turn around. Roz, you may be doing right pull by turn in, which could be the way this gentleman, I'm just saying the way this gentleman was taught, he may not may or may not be yours, but if he was taught that, oh, that could be what he's doing. Chances are from the description, if he's turning around to see what his partner's doing, it's because he's trying to dance her dance and make sure she does it right and he's screwing himself up doing it. But there's a lot of things, but it's little tiny things like this that happen all the time. And I remember a caller who was a very, very exceptional caller, a great trainer, and he taught me a lot. We had a conversation on the movement Do Paso. He had been calling for 20 years longer than I had, and he did not know that Do Paso ended in a courtesy turn because he, had, he was never taught that. He had never, used, he'd never gone and actually read the definitions. He taught what he was taught. He had a memory like that. <clears throat> and it, it's really strange. Brian has been teaching square through, and it used to be right pull by, turn in, left pull by, turn in. On the last hand, you go straight ahead. But they've changed that now that it's just straight ahead one. The turn in is the first part of each step <clears throat> after the first one. So little things like that. And if you remember in my session, it says, read the definition, understand the definition, but you had in brackets, the current one. Because in today's society, our definitions are fixed. Caller Lab has set the definitions and they are not going to change except by committee. And that is only going to happen on days that end with the letter Y. <laughs> yep. Yes, Brian. Um, I was just going to say uh, the issue with dancers that want uh, to no, talk and at the end of a square. Oh, I mean, I guess I don't need one. Um, <laughs> Hello, are we there? Um, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I will sometimes start the square through explanation by saying, if, if, like if we're going to have um, head couple square through, for instance, I will say head couple step into the middle and turn your back on your partner, face your corner. Now, this is where you are going to finish the square through. This will be the ending yeah. position. So if you end somewhere other than this, you haven't done the square through properly. Then I will take the dancers back out into the set again and say, okay, now we're going to do it like this. And they go through the, the definition. Another thing that I, I learned from uh, somebody else was get one of the men, if he's having trouble turning the wrong way, as some do, get him to take his wallet out and put it on the floor in the middle and say, now keep your eye on that wallet when you're doing this square through. Don't turn away from that wallet. So it makes him turn in all the time. I, I used to put a $5 bill on the floor. Yeah. And I said, well, we're going to do this. And, and the last couple standing gets all the money. <laughs> uh, the last group. Unfortunately, I had one class. I stopped doing it because I had five squares. <laughs> and it cost me $25 because they all got it right. <laughs> <laughs> but Good learning experience for you. It's, mm. it's not a... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, it's, it's not a right or a wrong on dealing with how this is going to work, what's going to happen. It's a matter of finding a way to get your message communicated across to the dancers that meets the interpretation of the definition that is correct with the definition, but is able to be understood by the dancers. Um, we've used square through as an example, recycle is another example of, of those kinds of things. And if you remember when I was talking about um, the ILO, the intended learning outcome, okay? It's what Brian is doing, he's taking the ILO and he's adding the components, which is an aspect of very successful teaching. And that is it requires the student or the learner to identify who and where they are in a formation. So you had them step in, face your corner, okay? I am facing my corner. Now that had highlighted relevant aspects, but then he says, ah, this is where you're going to end up. 
So he's now introduced what we call critical reflection, which is the start formation. I'm starting in a static square and the end position. This is where you're going to end up. I'm going to be ending up facing you. And he's then put in into that intended learning outcome, the identifiable criteria of which way do I turn? What do I do? When do I turn and where I have to end up? So you're adding all of those factors into the teaching aspect. Now, uh, if you go through the actual notes and whatnot, I talk a lot about teaching, but this is the theory behind successful teaching. It's not how to teach because no one can teach you how to teach. You have to find your own way to teach. Nobody can teach you how to teach. I can teach you how to regurgitate the theory of teaching. I can teach you how to teach in order to write a test to pass your teaching degree, but I cannot teach you how to teach. I can show you all the things that you may need to know to be successful as a teacher, but you have to find your own way to apply them. And that's why I say there's no right list. There's no right teaching method. There's no one way to teach because how I teach Hannah might be very different than how I would have to teach Lars, which would be very different between Scotty and Roz. It would be two completely different aspects. You have to find that way to meet them all and then find a middle ground to get out to the generalities of your intent in a holistic context. And once that's out there, the dancers are starting to have success. You've got to be able to pick out those individuals that are having an issue and approach them the way they want to learn. Okay, It's not what we have been doing for 40 years. Here's 100 dancers. 30 of them do well, pick it up. I'm going to call to those 30 dancers and give them excitement and learning. And I'll get rid of 70 dancers that are on the floor because, oh, they're too slow. It's not making it easy for me. Calling is hard work. Teaching is very, very hard work. It takes a lot more skill and a lot more knowledge to teach than it does to call. And there are some exceptional teachers out there that cannot call worth a damn. There's some exceptional callers out there that cannot teach worth a damn. But I can tell you right now, if you get a good teacher that can present the material in a way that the dancers can understand it, can use it, can apply it, can reflect on it, and can assess success with that material, even if that caller is an average singer and an average choreographer, the dancer's success is what's going to make that caller a good caller not how well that he can do square through from an inside inverted hourglass that's half sashayed on a right angle thing with an axis 25 degrees from the corner hall inverted in a left-hand formation. And if any of you followed that, I challenge you to stop calling because I just made that crap up. <laughs> okay, But that's what callers are looking for. That's not what dancers are looking for. Roz, you got your hand up. Yeah, I guess... Even with this person having trouble, which he's still having trouble with it, but he has improved, I have learnt so many different ways of looking at square through four mm -hmm. that, I mean, it's helped me in my teaching just from this one person that's had so much trouble. Yep. So, and, and one thing to watch when they say don't turn, when we've got four callers, so two of us teach the correct definition and two of us teach the old definition, which probably doesn't help. No, it but, doesn't. I'm also careful of, like, don't turn around when you say don't. The only thing the dance is here is turn around. Okay, what I'm going to do. I hear the end bit. I'm so, going to give you two things right now that are going to maybe assist you. Yes. Okay? I want everybody to close your eyes for a second. Just close your eyes. And I want you to think of anything except a blue horse. Do not think of a blue horse. A blue horse is the last thing I want you to think of. Think of anything else except a blue horse. Okay. So where is the obvious direction going there? With the, ex with the exception of Brian, it's probably not at off. But uh, <laughs> a red uh, fish. I was looking. I was okay. thinking of a red fish. But this Green is mouse. <laughs> this is the one thing. And the problem is you have to actively engage your brain to think of something different than what you're being told not to think of. It is a normal human physiological reaction and a psychological reaction. Now, it doesn't say, doesn't mean it can't be done. 
but you have to actively engage that. And to do that, you have to access different parts of the brain, which means you have to shut off other parts of the brain that are part of that critical thinking mess. The second thing is habit. A habit once started takes 28 days of consistent daily application to break. It takes one instant to reaffirm that habit. Now that's part of, that's another psychological fact. That's part of the, the learning process. So if you have a habit, for instance, chewing with your mouth open, which might be a habit, that has to be reinforced not to do that for 28 days before that habit ceases to exist. It has to be critically analyzed, pointed out to you, and you have to take a corrective action for 28 consecutive days. If you take a couple of days or you don't do it, that habit's never going to break. Dogs are the same way, animals are the same way, and lo and behold, people are the same way. If a person has a habit, they will continue to do that habit until it is reinforced in a specific context that it will change. Square dancing is a bit unique like that. It has to be reinforced for at least 28 dances consistently with that person, whether they're weekly or monthly, before that habit will break. Doesn't mean you won't get it right some of the time, but it'll take a lot of consistent reinforcement. I've got Janet yeah. with her up, and then I've got Roz. Well, to help with the um, square through issue, to keep them from turning the wrong way, what I like to do is give them something familiar that they're familiar with to look at. And so the four dancers that are doing the square through, I tell them they are standing on the four corners of a table and we're going to walk around the edge of the table and you don't want to fall off the table. So if you walk around the edge of the table, they always turn the correct way and we walk through it nice and slow so that everybody makes their turns. And I don't have a problem with everybody turning the wrong way because they're very familiar with what a tabletop looks like and which way they need to go to walk around that tabletop. Yep. I've, I've seen callers actually take chairs from the audience uh, off the side, put it in the middle of each square when they teach square through and they go Done around. That. <laughs> Lots of things where I've got Roz and then I've got Guido with his hand up. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, do I have to go and visit him each day then to get him out of the square through four? No, no. What I was saying was it <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> of an activity. So if you if he dances once a week, you've got to make mm. sure you reinforce that every week for 28 consecutive events because it's a yeah. contextual thing. Yes, Guido. Um, I have caught myself doing the right and left through or, or courtesy turn at the third hand of a square through it uh, when I'm not re really concentrated when I dance. Um, and I definitely know that there is no courtesy turn in a square through. Mm -hmm. um, usually, I'm caught on the wrong foot at the moment, uh, which means that my, my own positioning is wrong in that very instant of time. So in many cases, I attribute this to um, dancers not paying attention to what they're doing because I reflect on, I reflect on myself and I usually don't care about uh, what many others say about teaching square through. When I teach a class, I teach them at some time pass through courtesy turn, then I use a right pull by courtesy turn, and then I use a square through one courtesy turn, and at some time I tell them it's a right and left through. I never teach right and left through. So um, it for me, this is a discussion um, where it comes to how do the dancers get to know that movement. And since I myself do that mistake uh, sometime, and I definitely know that there is no courtesy turn in there, uh, I really don't care about it. Um, I try to, if a dancer does this constantly, consistently and all all the time then i need to talk to the dancer but uh in general it, they just do it at some time 
Again, and not always. And you're absolutely correct, Guido. And you actually made a point that I forgot to mention. Um, when you have negative transfer, okay, there's a difference between negative transfer and an honest mistake. Negative transfer is a consistent application of doing something or applying something that is pre-learned into, or a condition that's pre-learned into a new condition of similarity that causes problems or causes an issue where there's an error made. For instance, doing a courtesy turn on the square through. That is a very different thing than occasionally making a mistake. And I'm glad you brought that up because it is something, oh, I actually saw this at a dance not too long ago where one of the dance they had called square through, <laughs> seems to be everybody's favorite movement. They called square through about half a dozen times. And then on one, one of the dancers who had been dancing it successfully for about three or four tips, did a courtesy turn and the caller, because it was a new dancer class, the caller stopped and did a 15 minute workshop on square through from all sorts of different formations. It was an honest mistake. It was bad in my, my opinion, because a mistake is a mistake. Dancers make mistakes. That's part of the fun of dancing. But that dancer that made the mistake, the caller stopped the whole thing. Says, oh, okay. I'm going to pick on John. John, remember, there's no courtesy turn on the square throughs. Let's look at that again. And then 15 minutes workshopping square through, and the whole floor is going, okay, way to go, John. <laughs> that's like being in the army and you do something wrong and your whole squad except you does push-ups because you got it wrong it doesn't feel good trust me it does not feel good if you're the one that made that mistake honest mistakes do happen uh, Roz and that's something that you and that's why I said very glad you brought it up if you have this dancer you said he doesn't do it all the time but he, he's pretty consistent doing it he's getting better great don't don't reinforce it if he's improved Accentuate the positive. Set that up. Great job, everybody. Don't isolate. You can talk to him privately. Don't isolate him on the floor, but accentuate that that positive. You know, and if he does it, right, or if he does do it, you know, square through four, and he's turned around and looking at his partner. Now you're all looking at your corner. I'd give you a hug, but you're not all looking at your corner. Do it outside of your corner, whatever. You know, just just something like that, and then move on. Don't. Don't really go to town on it because it might have just been an honest mistake. There is one thing that happens a lot in the younger dancers in the States, particularly in um, the Western United States, and it happens in Germany a lot. On a square through, you see dancers and they'll do a right pull by and a quick courtesy turn and an adjustment of the position for the next one and a, and a left pull by and then a right pull by and a quick courtesy turn and they adjust to get to the next thing because they'll do that really quick spin around, which is part of the styling. And you'll see others that'll do the flying octopus with the hand all joined and they do the, the square through with the dip and dive and things like that. Those are regional styling things. That dancer that's doing the right pull by and the courtesy turn and whipping around but is not interfering with the square is not really causing a problem. Are you waving at me or are you saying goodbye? No, I, I was just waving at Hannah and Lars. We're uh, having a little tate to tate on the side. Nah. You know, those are things you don't want to discourage, but you don't want to encourage either. If the dancers are having fun doing it, let them do it, but make sure that you control it because there's nothing more frustrating for a new dancer than having somebody that's got his own interpretive styling and does a courtesy turn. And this new dancer is trying to learn that it, it will throw them completely off. You can change that by doing a half sachet, or you can change that by doing, putting them in lines and calling a square through four or, or what have you, or, or all sorts of things, put them in lines and call centers only square through four. Ooh, what happened there? You know, what have you? Let them do what they want to do when it doesn't interfere with the dance, as long as it doesn't interfere with the dance. And it, if it, it doesn't, is. you have new dancers, take a moment to see if you can find a fix without isolating that person. But if you do have to, do it away from the dance floor. You know, those are really, really important things. Brian, you had your hand up. Yeah, when, when you said uh, just the centers do something uh, square through, um, and interesting, this is, this is not for beginners, but it's, it's uh, an interesting way of looking at square through is to have 
say, zero lines, and then call just the ends square through three hands outside the set, end up on the other end of your own line facing out, then have those same ends run around the nearest center. Now the new ends square through three hands outside the set, end up on the other end of your own line. <laughs> those same ends run around the nearest center, now everybody passed through and just the center four, our man left. Everybody do a right and left grand. Yep. And that, that also reinforces the not doing the courtesy turn. It's a little absolutely, thing. Absolutely, absolutely. It reinforces the turning in. It goes into, I think it was Janet who was saying, going around the table. Well, yep. your, your center four dancers are your table. And when you do it after a while, if your dancers have picked it up, you can do just the ends square through three while, while the centers square through four. And you can really start, and then, you know, end it where, what are you going to do from there? Oh, everybody cloverleaf in your home, you know? Yeah. If now, you have, um, this is a neat little resolve to home that I use from time to time. If you have um, head couples pass through, or heads or sides, doesn't matter which ones, um, pass through, separate around one, make a line. So you've got boy, boy, girl, girl lines. And then say, everybody move up to the middle and back. Just the centers step forward and shake right hands. Hold that hand. Don't let go. Just the ends step forward and shake left hands. Don't let go. Just the ends do a left square through four hands outside the set. Just the centers square through three hands in the center of the set. Everybody, bow to your corner. Works well, really gone. neat. I would have gone Alaman left, but you're right. Oh, well, Alaman left, Alaman left, because everybody's got a left hand free. Yes. Yeah, Alaman left is fine. And then bow to your partner, because you're home. But as I said, we, I, I wasn't really trying to focus on choreography, but you're absolutely great. And, and these are absolutely perfect things that you can find and use and talk with experienced callers. It's not a matter of how I do it, how you do it, how Brian does it. But there are useful tricks such as square through around the outside or outsides, squish them in, make a box, centers square through on the inside, got to stay within that box. There's only one way they can turn. They cannot courtesy turn in there because there's no room. Okay. And now those, those are just, you know, they're gimmicky things. Square through around the outside, not so much a gimmicky thing. It's not really where the definition of square through goes, but it does reinforce the methodology and the traffic pattern of that movement. So if you find something like that that works, use it. And it doesn't have to be difficult, just a little bit different adds that variety. And you notice the one thing on that, we can square through around the outside, very easy to pick up. Outsides run, new outsides square through around the outside. New outsides run. They're still the same outside. What you're doing is adding a dimension to the dancers that is something that pulls choreography that is from the known into the known with a little bit of change, but almost 99% guarantee of success feeling different. You don't have to say ends with the outside working with the phantom. I want you to do a square through two and then with the phantom couple do a left square through two coming back into everybody ending up in a trade by position while new insides do a clover leaf and the other ones do this and the dancers are going to yeah uh, the coat rack is where i want to go home because that's what's going to happen and unfortunately too many callers today look for the cleverness and the technical of their choreography as opposed to the danceability and the fun of simple variety to entertain the dancers. We've got to get back to entertaining the dancers if we want this activity to survive. Yes, Ross. Brian, would you mind putting that figure in the chat? I got most of it down, but you went too quick. <laughs> and I think Yolanda was the same because, yeah, she said, that's why I record. <laughs> uh, you, you want me to, to write it in the in the chat here, do you? Yeah, that'd be good. And then every, everyone can have it if possible. Yeah. And, I've, and Brian, I've been writing a few little things to Guido. Guido and I have just been having a bit of um, stuff going backwards for, and forwards too. But yeah, yeah I'm, you, I'm happy to you, do use, that. Use partner Brian, so you don't confuse anybody. 
I'm sorry, what was that? Use partner lines so you don't confuse anybody. Pa instead of zero lines. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. That's right, we adapt, don't we, <laughs> Yolanda? <laughs> I, act I actually had my comeuppance because I was talking with a couple of uh, older callers and we were talking zero lines or box one four or you know one p two p lines. We all knew what we were talking about, except there was a new caller joined us, and we were talking zero lines and and one p two p's, and we lost them. And we never even thought that you know what, if somebody's only been calling for about five years, they may have never been exposed to zero line. Mm -hmm. They they're looking for pl. And any choreography with ZL, they're going to get rid of it because they don't know that yet. <laughs> it's more the one P two P that got us confused, I think. Hmm. Yeah, the, yeah. When we hmm. first started with these classes, it was like I looked at it like three generational ways of speaking caller talk. <laughs> oh. It is. It is a lot of fun uh, when you get that takes a while to figure out what is all equivalent to something else. Oh, it, it is. It's, uh, and especially when you, you start looking at the way callers talk to each other. If you remember when I said, um, let's just try something here. Okay, we're gonna look at eight chain, let's say an eight chain four formation. Pretty standard. So I'm going to, a B1C, who knows what a B1C is? Not everybody. Okay. How about a box one four? Some know it. An, an Alaman left box. A zero box. A <laughs> corner box. A facing corners box. They're all the same. But if I say a B3R, what's that? Oh, wait a minute. Okay, the B3R. So I got to take boy number three, right? Okay. Ah, okay. So that's an out of order lead to the left box out of sequence. Now there are callers that are outside. So if I want to go from a B1C switching over to a B3R, and then taking that from uh, facing line, switch it into a 5L1P, what do I need to call? So if I'm, I'm there and I'm in sequence and I got a 5-1LP, okay, so I can do a, a box in that right and left there. That'll take me to my, my L1P, touch a quarter, boys run, will take me to my B1P, uh, slide through, that's back to my L1P, pass through, bend the line. Uh, that'll take me to a 5L2P with partner out of sequence. If I have the ends full, that'll take me to a B1P facing partner in sequence. Past the ocean takes me to a 5L2P out of sequence. Um, at plus, I can go pass through partner trade and roll, which take me to a B1P facing partner in sequence. Meanwhile, you've got a new caller going, what the? Now, by the way, just so everybody knows, I have no concept of that. I'm reading this off the screen, okay? But these are some of the older connotations. If we look at five, what does five mean? Five is the same as half today, okay? Because we had one, two, three, four, five arrangements or a half sachet, you know? We hear things like, uh, if I have an O line or I have an, an O partner, what's an O partner as opposed to a zero partner? Original. Opposite. Could be original, it could be opposite. But what's a zero partner? Normal couplers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Has no relationships. It just says boy on the left, girl on the right. Those kind of acronyms, FASAR definitions, and all the rest of that kind of stuff serve one purpose. And that's for callers that know what they're talking about to shorten their conversations so they don't have to explain the choreography to get you there. So if I say, right, I want a box one four, I could say a head square through box. I could say a corner box. I could do whatever it is to change that to my terminology 
or change my terminology so that another dancer or another caller can understand what I'm talking about. Guess what? They're all right. Caller Lab has standard definitions and standard abbreviations for references and therefore communication. It doesn't make Brian saying a zero box or a zero line wrong. It doesn't make Guido saying a P3P line right or wrong. It doesn't make anybody else saying uh, an in order, out of order, whatever wrong. You can easily say lead to the heads, lead to the right, right and left through. Or you can say a lead right box out of sequence. Or you could say three or four other different descriptions for that. As long as the two people are having an active communication where they understand each other, guess what? You're doing it right. The same thing applies to calling and teaching. As long as you have that participation engagement with the two of you are communicating back and forth and understanding what you're getting across, you're doing it right. The, the difficulty for newer callers is when they're talking to older callers mm -hmm. or experienced callers is that some of the literature that the older callers used in their newer callers time is no more available. Yeah. And so they can't read it. So they don't have the connection to it. They just get exposed. Um, I have two ways of communication. I have the communication with others and I have the communication with myself. Um, when I talk to myself, or if I write something down for myself, I use different notation than I, if I would talk to somebody else. Yeah. And if, if, if you want me, if, if I said to any of you in this session, Phil, I'm just going to pick on you for a second. Okay. If I said to you, okay, put the square into facing lines, you'd know what I was talking about, wouldn't you? I think. Well, you, you know what facing lines are. Yeah, sure. Okay. Do, doesn't matter. I haven't put any gender facing lines. If I say, um, Phil, put the, the square into normal couples parallel boxes, like an eight chain four box, a boy on the left, girl on the right. You could take a mile to just that, figure it out in your head. You know, so if you I want said, a eight chain through formation. Yep. Okay. And I, I could say, Phil, put them into a square through box. Or I could say, Phil, put them into a corner box. Now I'm starting to add things onto it. But if I said the first off, I said, okay, get them into an eight chain box, eight chain through boxes or parallel boxes or parallel ocean waves. As long as the person I'm trying to communicate understands what I'm saying, it doesn't really matter what kind of conversational name I give it. I'm gonna put a number in the chat. Does any, anybody know what that number is? A number of different uh, sequences you could build off of something. No, not even that. Not even that complicated. Is it your phone number? <laughs> no. Okay. Has anybody here heard of FASAR? Formation, <laughs> arrangement, sequence, and relationship. If you take a square, and we'll take this whole thing up, and let's look, for instance, if we put the phantom concept into square dancing, so you can work on these parallels, the angles and whatnot, <laughs> what you have is a grid of 31 places to stand in a square. So that's the place, the half place, everything else, and all, all the little middle places. So that's what it works out to. If you've got 31 places and you've got eight dancers, okay, Fazar is an explanation that will tell you where every dancer is on the floor, what their sequence is, what their relationship, and who they're with. So if I say a Fazar being a corner box, that tells you that they're in boxes and they're all facing their corner. They can do an Alaman left from there. If I say they're in partner lines, that's a Fazar description that says everybody has their partner 
they're in normal couples. They're all in sequence. It tells me that. That number there is the number of combinations of places that dance it, that of places to stand for eight dancers in a square. That's how many Fazar descriptions you could actually come up with if you really wanted it. If you want the math on that, it's um, take 31 because there's 31 in a square. 31 times 31 is 961. You've got to go times eight. So 961 times 960 times 959 because you lose one position each time till you get down to there. And that's just a little over 706 quintillion or whatever it is. Yeah. Let's put it this way. If, if, if you were one of those technical callers that wanted to put the dancers through every one of those positions, do you know how long it would take? Too long. Three hundred time. If, if you wanted to stop and, and show them what each one of those formations, it would take you 375 million years. Or you could just say, that's a line, that's a box, that's a circle, right? Here's the basic ones that you really need to know. The rest you're just gonna move through because we really don't care. We're not gonna stop the dancers on each one of those. That's what my, um, my method of explaining this is. When you get into two by fours, so your standard formation, it comes down to just over 2 million combinations and it goes down when you add symmetry it goes to 196,000 combinations as you go down to working boy girl combinations you put formation arrangement sequence and relations there's 384 possible dancer states that's it six times four times four times four and that's every single thing that you have to know take it out of that you cut it down to 96 those 96 are fazar and of those you need to know probably four. Well, actually, 21. You need to know what a line is. You need to know what a box is. You need to know what a circle is. Okay. You need to know what a quarter tag is. Heads past the ocean. There's a quarter tag. Those are the only things you really need to recognize in, in FASAR. What's an eight chain four? What's a pass through position? What's a double pass through? What's a trade by position? Because if you can recognize those simple formations and be able to describe them, then you can call. Everything else is just passing through. Even that, you, you can communicate with other callers. Uh, if you have a fancy formation and you can define that from an eight chain through formation or facing lines or circle um, with the two or three calls, usually you, you can get everybody there. Yeah. Um, you, you don't need to define what kind of hourglass you have. Uh, if, the other dance, if the other caller doesn't know what an hourglass is, but, but you can call it there. Yeah, and, and you don't need to have all that information in your repertoire. There are some basic formations that you need to know and you need to know how to manage. That's a circle, a static square, a box, as in an eight chain four box, a double pass through, a trade by, a completed double pass through, ocean waves, and a quarter tag. And really, that's about all you need. The rest of them come, but you know, those are formations. All the rest of it is just clag where the dancers are. And if you can manage those formations and move dancers, guess what? You've got the foundation fundamentals of calling. Then if you're looking at sequence, when can I call an Alaman left? Well, you've got two things, relationship and sequence. Who's with who and where are they? And then, you know, you might eventually want to start branching out into arrangement. Oh, let's make these guys half sashayed. Let's, you know, do these kinds of things. Growth. Everybody says FASAR because it should be ARFS. ARFS, arrangement, relationship, formation, sequence. If you're going to learn how things go, how a movement, one movement to the next one, you do, um, Janet, Janet, oh, Janet just left. 
Jan did an excellent presentation on call analysis. Guido did an excellent presentation on call analysis and, and what I call the domino effect, if you will, on how these cards work. What movement can I do after this call? Guess what? All that is, is here's a movement, here's the definition. If I start in the box and I end in a line, this movement does that, star through, okay? I've done a box, I'm in box, I do star through, I end in line. I know that, what can I call from lines? Okay, I've got standard lines, so I've got my arrangement. Boy on the left, girl on the right, that's gotta come first. Okay. Relationship, I really don't care about that right now. F. Formation, lines to box, box line. Arrangement and formation are your, are your two big ones. Get those first. The rest will come. Anyway, we're in general chit chat here, John. Um, you can keep recording and whatnot, but I was just thinking for uh, Mark's benefit because we're probably about 300 megs right now. <laughs>